Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? This week's summary begins with the black hole photo. M87 from the Sagittarius system has been photographed after many, many decades of work. This is not a true photograph in any sense of the word. Rather, it is a visual representation of the radio waves received by a large network of radio telescopes. The collective efforts of over 200 engineers and scientists have led to this photograph. It all began with work from 1783 and a man named John Mitchell who formulated the idea that there may be super dense stars. This idea has been refined over successive generations with Einstein's theory of relativity and Hawking's work what is amazing with these photographs is not necessarily that they have pictured the black hole itself, which is generally considered impossible, but rather how close they've managed to get the resolution to the event horizon. But this picture has gone as far as the black circle that is the black hole itself. This is so very impressive because nothing can escape the gravitational pull. This includes light. The ability to be able to get the photograph that close to the event horizon has required a great deal of effort and four clear days with perfect weather. Only with those circumstances were they able to capture this picture. You may wonder why it needed so long and why it was so hard. To give some context, light takes eight minutes to reach Earth from our sun. This black hole is 55 million light years away. That is 55 million times the distance that light could travel in the same period of time in one year. Moving on to the actual images themselves, you might be forgiven for imagining it was a scene from Lord of the Rings. This somewhat shadowy and hazy image is in fact a high quality picture given its circumstances. Given how much of a fine resolution it has presented. By contrast, looking at the larger gas cloud that surrounds the black hole, you can see just how focused this picture is. The larger image that has been zoomed out is impressive in its own right for its own reasons. The researchers and engineers were able to get this picture by using multiple telescopes set up across a number of locations including the Arctic Circle, the Antarctic Circle, Hawaii, South America, Mexico, America, and parts of Europe. This work has both amazing visual confirmation of a black hole, but also relevance to research in general. It has proven Einstein's theory of relativity a second time. The team responsible has compared their work to being in New York, and trying to count the dimples on a golf ball in Los Angeles, or imaging an orange on the moon, this is why they needed such a large array set up. These first few images are only the tip of an iceberg, and since they've come out, there have been six academic papers published, and there are likely hundreds more to come in the near future. To give some concept of the size of this black hole, XKCD has created a kind of comic. You'll note that Pluto's orbit doesn't even cover the rim of the black hole, and Voyager, a spacecraft we launched into space in 1977, just over 40 years ago, would barely be leaving the rim of the black hole. Not the black hole's gravitational pull, just the black hole itself. Going from the most amazing astronomical events imaginable we now move on to the bizarre and unexplained. There's a star in the Milky Way that shouldn't exist. There is a star called J0023 plus 0307. And it is strange. So strange that astronomers believe it should not exist. It contains practically no carbon, but has a very high amount of lithium an unusually high amount of lithium. Lithium, along with other elements in the periodic table, was one of the first formed after the Big Bang, and those stars that have an unusually high amount of it 
tend to have formed during the primitive period of the universe, within the first 300 million years after the Big Bang. The reason this star is believed to be a primitive star is its high lithium content which would form during that period, but a lack of other heavier elements that formed well after this. Given its location and the nature of the finding, this star is a bizarre, or is that this star, discovery. Getting closer to Earth, yet another meteor has exploded over Siberia. This is the third major fireball in four months. Siberia is becoming almost infamous for its recordings of meteorites exploding in the region. Unfortunately, it's also causing fear in the locals who continue to experience this unexpected, unpredicted, and rather terrifying event. Locals would have some idea of what would happen when a meteorite hits, as in 1911, a meteor exploded in the Tunguska area. This had the estimated force of 185 Hiroshima atomic bombs. It destroyed 80 million trees. Given the history between Russia and Japan, Japan's decision to start dropping bombs on an asteroid in the name of science is a likely happy coincidence. Japan's space agency has said it successfully dropped a small bomb weighing roughly 2 kilograms on an asteroid called Ryugu. The Hayabusa 2 spacecraft dropped the bomb on Ryugu on Friday in an effort to create an artificial crater. The Hayabusa had to run away after deploying its bomb and will return shortly to take photographs of the site. After that, it will attempt to take samples from under the surface. This is in an attempt to understand both the formation of craters in space and, if possible, collect water and organic samples which could help the agency understand the history of the solar system. The Hayabusa 2 is expected to return to Earth by late 2020 with these samples. While the Hayabusa 2 is being successful, Israel's first mission to the moon has failed spectacularly. Israel privately funded a space probe called Bereshit and launched it into space in February. They used one of SpaceX's launching platforms. It took the 1300 pound robot into space, and unfortunately on Thursday it crashed into the surface when one of its primary engines failed. The Bereshit probe has been in the works since 2011. This came about from Google announcing a cash prize for those who developed and deployed a moon lander. Although they were unable to win that, they continued with the project using private funding. A South African billionaire named Morris Khan donated most of the money for this project, and surprisingly he is not that put out at having lost $43 million in a destroyed probe. In fact, he views it as a very positive event, in that it may encourage new Israeli scientists to pursue works in the space industry. The Bereshit program was not a complete failure. In fact, it has achieved many admirable achievements. It has successfully spent seven weeks in space. It successfully traveled between the Earth and the Moon to get to its target. It entered orbit and was otherwise on a successful transit to the ground. Unfortunately, the engine failure and the inability to reboot the system in time led to failure, but overall, you could consider it a relative success. If Bereshit had succeeded, it would have made Israel one of only four countries to have ever touched down on the moon. In a twist of irony, we go from the highlights of the week to the worst news of the week. New York City has just had to declare mandatory measles vaccines. This has a very close relationship to Israel. And there was an ongoing joke among pro-vaccine arguments that the government was not going to go around forcing people to have vaccines against their will. At the time, it was felt that most people had enough common sense to recognize the benefit. Unfortunately, New York State, and New York City in particular, has proven this belief to be generous. New York City has imposed mandatory vaccines 
in four Brooklyn zip codes. This comes after 285 people have been diagnosed with measles. 246 of these were children, 21 have been hospitalised, and 5 have gone into the ICU, but fortuitously no one has died yet. This is the largest outbreak in the city in nearly three decades, which should speak to the horror given that in early 2000s, measles was considered eradicated in America. The postcodes in questions are predominantly populated by ultra-Orthodox Jewish people. The combination of people returning to Israel where they can pick up measles and then bringing it back to the States is one reason why this has become an epicenter for the disease. Along with the close environment of religious educational institutes called yeshivas, more and more people are being exposed to measles unnecessarily. At least 40 cases have been linked to one particular yeshiva. Interestingly, the Torah makes no specific mention of whether or not there is a religious reason not to be vaccinated. Ultimately, New York City has given people two choices. Either accept vaccinations or face a fine of $1,000. Ultimately, there is no religious reason not to accept vaccination. And given that there is a financial penalty, there is no reason not to accept the vaccinations, more so when you are travelling to or from regions where you may either contract or spread the disease. This is an argument that applies to everyone else as well. What will be interesting is to see if the anti-vaxxer argument that vaccines cause autism is vindicated through this mandatory vaccination program. If there is no sudden spike in the diagnosis of autism, it will make very clear that there is no fundamental support for this theory. On the other hand, there is a novel new treatment for autism. A faecal transplant therapy has reduced autism severity by 47% in the children who received it. There has been a long-term postulation that autism shares a common cause with the microbes in the gut, that this faecal transplant has reduced the severity of autism would appear to support this argument. In 2017, Arizona University researchers gave doses of healthy bacteria to autistic children. They are now following up on the state of those children 24 months later. Having returned to their original group of volunteers, it turns out they were not demonstrating any adverse effects, and the faecal transplant was progressing nicely. Autistic children have an unfortunate penchant for temperamental digestive tract, which can be readily upset by food and environmental conditions, such as stress. This is one reason why the faecal transplant was postulated. They gave 18 children aged between 7 and 16 this procedure, all were on the autism spectrum, and they were matched with 20 appropriate control subjects. Overall, the autistic children involved saw an 80% reduction in their digestive tract problems. That would, in and of itself, be an interesting outcome. What is even more interesting is that at the beginning, 83% of the initial group could be considered severely autistic. After two years, this is just 17%, and 44% of them no longer make the cutoff for being on the mild end of the autism spectrum. This gives an average reduction of autism symptoms of 47%. An otherwise harmless and very risk inverse treatment has reduced severity of symptoms by half. Compare this with the pseudoscience and woo that is about in the form of the Miracle Mineral Solution, CD Protocol, and other ridiculous nonsense peddled by charlatans. This is a very promising treatment. Going from gut microbes that are benefiting autistic children, there is an outbreak of people ill from E. coli in five states in America. In fact, 72 people in five different states 
have been admitted for foodborne illnesses, all relating to one particular strain of E. coli. Food poisoning in and of itself is not that unique. What is interesting here is the geographically discrete areas and the fact that it is the same thing causing it in all of them, and the CDC has yet to figure out why. The patients are from 1 year to 74 years, with most in their teens. Nobody has been able to figure out what they've eaten or what they've been drinking that has caused the E. coli infection. The CDC strongly believes that there is a single common cause, more so since a particular strain called 0103 as an outbreak is very rare. The last highest incidence only had 29 people involved. This current outbreak has more than doubled that figure and is likely not yet at its peak. While E. coli is ravaging parts of America, Researchers have found a prospective new cancer vaccine that helps to teach the immune system what to target. Cancer has historically been difficult from an immunological perspective because it has cloaking mechanisms that make the immune system mistake it for a healthy functional cell and so the immune system does not target it. What is especially relevant here is that this particular vaccine has been used with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that typically resists conventional treatments and as such is a very stubborn cancer. What the researchers have done is create a treatment that acts as an extra flag to the tumour. When injected, this vaccine acts as an aggravator for the immune system. It makes the cells secrete biomarkers and chemoattractants that make the immune system interested in that site. The immune cells give closer observation of what is there and take back the cancer cell markers to dendritic cells that then create a cascade and the rest of the immune system begins to function better against the cancer. Stimulating the immune system this way is a far more effective way of treating the tumour than things like chemotherapy which are universal. By activating the immune response, the body attacks it itself and does so in a targeted manner. This treatment also avoids some other issues, in particular something called the checkpoint blockade, which inhibits the T-cells that destroy the cancer. Having been initially tested in 11 patients and having demonstrated efficacy in an animal model, this treatment may well progress reasonably quickly onto the next stage of a clinical trial. However, as with all cancer treatments, it is highly experimental at present. Another treatment being investigated at present is a HIV therapy. This is in theory more effective than conventional antiretroviral drugs. HIV is hard to treat, not just because it is a virus, that because it is a virus that almost universally hides in the immune cells that are meant to target it. By hiding in an immune cell, it is less frequently attacked. Antiretroviral drugs must be taken for the lifetime of the person infected, and as a consequence can have long-term negative consequences on the person's health. When a person infected with HIV stops taking the antiretroviral, the HIV virus comes out of dormancy and begins to cause trouble again. Extended periods with the HIV virus active can create worse consequences than the antiretroviral can. The researchers from the University of Pittsburgh took a common target of the T-cells, the cytomegalovirus, and used that as the basis for their treatment. Their therapy activates T-cells that target this particular virus. It also helps to target the HIV virus because the same T-cells are responsible for keeping HIV in check. Unlike the antiretroviral therapies, this does not suppress the HIV virus, but instead forces it out of the cell, where it is then attacked by the immune system. This removes the virus and does not suppress it. In other news, 
we found traces of the elder god Cthulhu. Researchers in the UK have found a small, multi-tentacled creature that is roughly 15 millimeters in diameter, or three-fifths of an inch. It was armored all over. Although Cthulhu may not particularly appreciate it, the researchers have named it Solacina Cthulhu, species number. In other news about strange and unusual animals, researchers have been dropping alligator carcasses into the Gulf of Mexico to attract bizarre hill bug like creatures. The idea was to investigate prehistoric creatures to see how they would feed on them. And much to the researchers surprise, they were attracted to the body in very short order, within hours rather than the days or weeks that they anticipated. The body was being fed on, and they are very, very large, about the size of a football. If you're looking to travel to Mexico, you may wish to reconsider. In similar news about the strange and unusual, or in this case terrifying, a 5.1 meter python has been caught in the Florida Everglades. The snake weighed just under 64 kilograms and was female. The researchers used tracking technology to follow males around. The males would take them to the females and the clutches of eggs they have during this breeding season. The researchers could then remove the female and the male and the eggs. The python in question is an invasive species that came to be there through a combination of a multitude by owners, people abandoning their snakes after they got too big, and a number of instances of disasters that freed the animals within exotic wildlife parks. Removing the snakes as an invasive species will help to protect the local wildlife that is native to the region. The final bizarre creature this week is one that resembles the Sarlacc from Star Wars. It has 18 tentacles and funnels food into its gaping maw. The fossil was found in southern China and is 518 million years old. The creature is called Daiwan Sankyo and lived on the ocean floor like an anemone. It pulled in unsuspecting prey with its tentacles that are covered in cilia Cilia are small hairs that would help it hold on to these prey. It is prospectively an ancestor of the current jellyfish. These are carnivorous blobs that live in the ocean and perform a similar role. In less terrifying but even more bizarre news, we better understand why water behaves in an unusual manner. Water is at its most dense between 0 and 4 degrees centigrade. Below this, as is solid, ice floats on water because it is less dense. Above this, it becomes less dense again, and then eventually it turns into steam, above 100 degrees centigrade. This unusually high vaporization point is important, both for things like distillation, but also for life. Researchers were trying to understand why water has such a bizarre profile in its behaviour, and they now think they understand. Water molecules form a tetrahedron, essentially a four-point triangle. When in combination with other tetrahedrons, it shares one common water molecule. This allows it to form a semi-crystalline lattice, with a relatively high amount of organisation. When you combine this with high organization and a small amount of disorganized material, water can behave in strange and unusual ways. The researchers used a supercomputer to model the behavior of water based on these known attributes. For this reason, water is especially special among all liquids. The next story this week is a case study involving vitamin D, kidney failure, a 54-year-old man, and a naturopath. Given that last participant, you can likely imagine that this does not go well. A man was taking vitamin D as a supplement. This is not necessarily unusual. In fact, in some northern countries, it is especially common during winter, where there is almost no natural light. 
The reason we know of this case is that he was referred urgently to a nephrology clinic after his kidneys started to fail. He had an exceptionally high creatine level. After returning from a trip to Southeast Asia, and this is the crux of the issue, he was there for roughly two weeks. He spent considerable amounts of time relaxing under the sun when on holiday. This caused the vitamin D to become activated. If he had been taking vitamin D under the care of a qualified individual, he would be taking between 500 and 1000 IU, the measurement used for vitamin D. The maximum prescribable dose that is safe for a person is 1000 IU. His naturopath had told him to take 8 to 12 drops of the solution he had. Each drop contains between 500 and 1000 IU, which means a maximum of one a day. Under the direction of the naturopath, he was taking 8 to 12, which means he was receiving a dose of between 8000 and 12,000 IU each day for two and a half years. After 12 months of qualified treatment, his creatine levels and vitamin D concentrations had reached adequate and appropriate levels. However, he has been left with stage 3B kidney disease. This is a substantially reduced flow rate of just 34 milliliters a minute for his size. This is compared to the normal 1.2 to 1.3 liters a minute. The difference has a ratio of nearly 35. Going now from adults to children. Research into suicidal attempts and ideation among children between 2007 and 2015 has led to a rather unsettling discovery. In the roughly 10 years this study investigated, there has been a twofold increase in suicide attempts or ideation in those children admitted to an emergency department in the United States of America. This follows a similarly disturbing finding for a study between 1993 and 2008 that also saw a doubling of emergency visits for the same reasons. What is not understood is the underlying causality of this increase decade on decade. Physicians and researchers have been unable to figure out why the children are increasingly looking towards this, and unfortunately, they do not believe there is a solution on the horizon. There is speculation that the underprovision of services to support the psychological well-being of children, particularly within the public health service, is one reason for this, but they do not believe it explains the entire story. You will find a link in the description box below to a Wikipedia page outlining support services. In slightly more upbeat and pleasant news, the UN has put their support behind the design for a new floating city that is intended to provide housing and accommodation. These floating mega cities are made up of hexagonal units. Each tile can support 300 people and each of the villages are made up of six tiles. The cities themselves are expected to be able to hold 10,000 people. In theory, these cities will be highly affordable, whereas Hollywood has always demonstrated them to be the denizens of the rich, powerful, and otherwise influential. The intention is to have them as super clean and environmentally conscious. No high emitting processes whatsoever. They will be relatively self-sustaining, using a variety of ocean farming techniques, which could involve growing food underneath the water, such as kelp farms, or aquaponic systems that use waste from fish to fertilize their plants, along with high-density vertical farming. The cities are designed to be able to survive major environmental disasters, such as tsunamis and hurricanes. There will be more to their location and unable to move, which makes their name Floating City a slight misnomer. The final story this week has the brain behind Linux taking shots at social media. Linus Torvald recently conducted an interview in which he took aim at social media platforms like Facebook, 
Twitter and Instagram, the exact quote being, I absolutely detest modern media. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Another quote being, it's a disease. It seems to encourage bad behaviour. He was taking issue with the way social media tries to generate as much of an interaction as it can, regardless of why that interaction is occurring. The actions involving the Covington school students recently are a good example of this. The ability to share a story that got a lot of attention and a lot of interest very quickly ensured a lot of engagement, but not necessarily for the correct reasons. As Torvald said, the whole liking and sharing model is just garbage. There is no effort and no quality control. In fact, it's all geared to the reverse of quality control, with lowest common denominator targets and clickbait, and things designed to generate an emotional response, often one of moral outrage. He believes that the entire social media landscape is designed towards encouragement of flame wars and unsavory behavior, at least part of which he puts down to the ability to create content with anonymity. Torvald is effectively a powerhouse in the IT area. His creations are responsible for not only the platforms, but many of the services that are used on a daily basis. Take the Android operating system for example. It is essentially a stripped down and customized version of Linux designed to run on very limited devices. Then you have your online platforms and services that rely heavily on Linux based platforms for their ability to run servers and as a consequence the service itself. But their creator, or at least the major mind behind their creation, should be taking aim at the very services that are using it, will raise rather important questions within the industry. Unfortunately, this may lead to moral outrage, and the very thing that Linus Torvald has described as the problem with social media. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.